will explain to you the relationship between the last 10 ayat of the last 10 surahs of the Quran. Just the order of the last 10 surahs of the Quran, we'll go through it quickly. Just so you appreciate just that conclusion to that discussion that the surahs of the Quran are in remarkable order. Okay. So we'll begin with Surah Al-Fil. Anybody know the beginning of Surah Al-Fil? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-Fil. What is the surah about? It is about the Kaaba, the, Mac, uh, the city of Mecca being attacked by an army of elephants and it being protected. Allah Azza wa Jal protected that city under any circumstance. Even if, if it was facing an impossible enemy, impossible to fight against an army of elephants, it, Allah still protected that city. The very next surah is Surah Quraysh. How does it begin? لِإِلَى فِي قُرَيْشِ Allah Azza wa Jal talks about how He took care of the economic prosperity of the city of Mecca. رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ They could travel in the, in, the, in the winter and in the summer freely. Now, I want to take you back to a dua. A dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, remember he made the dua, make this a peaceful city? You remember that? Okay, I told you he said make this a peaceful city and provide its children from all kinds of fruit. And yesterday I told you that the peaceful city part is about its protection and law and order and security. And then the fruit part is about what? Economic prosperity. Actually, Surah Al-Fil and Surah Al-Quraysh together are the fulfillment of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. In Surah Al-Fil, even if an army of elephants attacks, the city is still safe. Allah will protect that city. Fulfilling the dua of Ibrahim when he said, Ya Allah, make this city safe. Then he said, provide them all kinds of fruit. And Allah says in the next surah that the Quraysh get to go and travel in the summer and in the winter. Now this is important people because the Quraysh were the center of Arabian society. And the Arabs were really, really big on robbing each other to death. Except they left the Quraysh alone. The Quraysh would only, they could travel whenever they want. So actually what the, what the other people used to do is, they only used to travel during the very difficult hot seasons. Or very intense cold seasons. They could only travel in those seasons. Why? Because then they know that the robbers, it's too hard for them to wait for us in the desert. So we can only travel during the tough times. So we'll go towards the hot climate in the summer, and we'll go towards the cold climate in the winter. Even though for convenience, what should you do? You go towards the cold climate in the summer, and you go towards the hot climate in the winter. But everybody else couldn't do that. But the Quraysh could go wherever they want. Free ride. No problem. Nobody will rob them. Why not? Because every other tribe used to have idols. And where are the idols stored? In Mecca. If you mess with them, they'll say, you took our money now. Watch what happens when I go back to Mecca. I'm going to take that idols of yours and... You see that giant monkey? Hmm. You watch whose tail is missing when you get there. <laughs> oh, you understand? <laughs> so they were afraid of messing with Makkah because the Makkans would then destroy their idols. So they, they left them alone. Also, after the in entire story of you know, the army of elephants being destroyed, the Mushrikun used to believe that the people of Quraysh are untouchable. They are crazy powerful. You don't mess with them because even elephants can't mess with them. So we'll leave them alone. So Allah says, رِحْلَةَ الشَّيْتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ What's incredible though is, Allah says, I made those conveniences for you. You can travel wherever you want, whenever you want, unlike anybody else. By the way, when they do travel out of season, what do they bring back? All kinds of fruits. They bring back out of season fruits. Nobody else has those fruits, they do. What was the dua of Ibrahim? Provide these people all kinds of fruit. وَرْزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ Provide them all kinds of fruits. Then Allah told the Quraysh, I'm providing you everything that Ibrahim asked for. You should at least be true to the legacy of your father. He built that house not so you could do shirk, not so you could worship false gods. He built that house so you can worship him. The reason that house is mentioned, or this house, the Kaaba is mentioned in that surah, is because the house was built by who? Ibrahim and their prosperity is directly a result of the prayer of Ibrahim. So everything's actually going back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Do you guys understand the relationship between Surah Al-Fil and Surah Quraysh? One after the other? Now that those two surahs have been mentioned together, Allah Azza wa Jal then mentions in the next surah, Al-Ma'un. You people, 
are supposed to fulfill the legacy of Ibrahim. And instead of fulfilling the legacy of Ibrahim, by the way, what is the legacy of Ibrahim? You worship Allah sincerely. You worship Allah sincerely, right? And as a result of worshiping Allah sincerely, you serve people. You do good to people. Ibrahim alayhi salam is very generous. Even when strangers come to his house, what does he do? He takes the best meat that he has. There's a, there's a baby cow in the back. No more. And he gets slaughtered and he, gets, he feeds them. You know, he's a giving person. He's a general, he cares about other people. Angels come and say, we're going to destroy the nation of Lut. What does he say? Hey, wait, wait, don't do that. Take care of those people. He's making dua for humanity. He's making dua for other people. He's caring about them. So he's got two qualities, Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's really close to Allah. He worships Allah sincerely and he cares about people. He really cares about people, right? The irony is, you people are supposed to be living up to the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Yet, let's see how you measure up. Let's see what you, meaning the Quraysh, look like. Well, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا يَحُبُّ عَلَىٰ طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينِ Have you seen the one who lies against the deen altogether? He doesn't encourage the feeding of the poor. He pushes the orphan around. You know, فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Then the worst kind of destruction should fall upon people who pray and pray only to show off. And when they pray, they're lazy and lackadaisical. They don't even care what they're praying, how they're praying. They're standing in salat like, you know. Okay, what kind of people are these? وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ And they're so cheap, and they're so miserly, they won't even give people ma'un. Do you know what ma'un is? Ma'un is little things. Somebody knocks on your door, you live in an apartment, somebody knocks on your door and says, Hey, do you have salt? We don't know what that is. <laughs> it's ma'un, it's, it's not going to kill you to give them a spoon of salt. <laughs> Take my salt. <laughs> so Allah is saying then in this surah, the criticism is you people don't pray sincerely and you're so cheap. Isn't that the exact opposite of what Ibrahim alayhi salam represents? So first Allah says, I gave you what Ibrahim asked for. And you're not true to your father's legacy in Surah Al-Ma'un. Then, let's see what happens next. Well, if you're not true to the legacy that Ibrahim alayhi salam was supposed to, you were supposed to fulfill that legacy, maybe there's someone else who does. The next surah is, Inna a'atainaka al-kawthar, Rasul sallallahu There, it's proven that the Quraysh are unqualified, unworthy of living up to the name of Ibrahim. Surah al-kawthar is proof that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is worthy of the legacy of Ibrahim. We've given you kawthar, what should you do? What were the two things Rasulullah was told to do in Surah Al-Kawthar? فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ Pray and sacrifice. Oh, pray and sacrifice. Wait a second. Whose legacy is that? Ibrahim alayhi salam. You fulfill the legacy. And then he says, Ibnashani akahu al abdar, your enemy will be discontinued. Oh my God, Allah already started calling who an enemy? Some, somebody's his enemy. Somebody's the Prophet's enemy. And I know tafsir will tell us who the enemy is, but in the text itself, it's a little ambiguous. Your enemy will be discontinued. So who is that enemy? Well, Allah just now mentioned that those people are unqualified. But the Prophet is qualified. So they say, wait, 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 even if the Prophet is qualified, He's still Quraysh. He's still one of us. We're all the same. We're all the same family. Actually, you're no longer the same family. Don't tell them, قُلْ يَا قَوْمِي قُلْ يَا قَبِيلَتِي قُلْ يَا قُرَيْشِ What is the next surah? قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ I'm gonna say that I have nothing to do with you people anymore. Y yes, we were both the same blood. We're Banu Hashim. We're from the Quraysh. We have lived here. My ancestry is here. But because of this La ilaha illallah, and because you have abandoned the legacy of our father Ibrahim, and I'm trying to hold on to the legacy of our father Ibrahim, we are now two separate ways. You are kafirun. You are not my people anymore. I will not call you my people. I will call you Al Kafirun. And I don't worship what you wor worship, and you don't worship what I worship. And you go your way, I go my way. Lakum dinukum. Waliyadin, when you say that, by the way, in the tribal world, in tribal society, when you tell your tribe, I have nothing to do with you, you go your way, I go my way. You know what that's considered? It's considered treason. And once you declare that I have nothing to do with my tribe, that tribe becomes your 
enemy. In other words, Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun is a declaration of war. We have to understand Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun is a declaration of war. Now, if there is a declaration of war, that means from here on out there is a conflict, a physical conflict between the Prophet ﷺ and who? And the Quraysh, his own people, who no longer get called his own people anymore. If there is a conflict, then you have to, at the end of the day, in a conflict, somebody will win. Someone will win and someone will lose. So what does Allah do in the next surah? He let us know who's going to win and who's going to lose. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ SubhanAllah the, 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 the war has been declared in Al-Kafirun. The victor has been declared in إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ But the promise of victory does not mean that the victory happens right away. I'll give it to you in a visual way. You see the clouds, but it hasn't rained yet. But before you know, even before you know it's going to rain, you can tell that it's going to rain because you're seeing the clouds and you can feel in the wind. You can sense that rain is coming, right? Now the Prophet is command or, or declared, he's been told that victory is coming. People are going to enter Islam in lots of numbers. And he was told this very early. And even though he was told this very early, it didn't look like Islam is going to win very early. There were no indications that Islam will win actually, because there were so few Sahaba, and the Quraysh were so powerful, even elephants couldn't take them down. It didn't look like the Muslims are going to see people entering into Islam, afwajan, multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes. Hard to imagine. When you make a big promise of victory, when you make big promises, then it's important to at least get some signs, some hope. This is an important concept. So before I go to the next surah, I want you to understand the concept. Zakaria alayhi salam is told that he's going to have a son. Pretty big deal. It's a big deal, so he says, Ya Allah, I believe you, but can I have some sign? He says, you won't speak to people for three days. He gives him a sign. Similarly, you have in the Qur'an, in this case, Allah Azza wa told Rasul Sallallahu you will take over all, the deen of Allah will be victorious. But unlike Zakaria who went to Allah and asked for a sign, Allah does not wait for the Prophet to ask for a sign. Allah says, listen, I know you don't think victory is easy, let me show you. Okay, you tell me who your worst enemy is. Okay, my worst enemy is Abu Lahab. Okay, let me, let me make an example out of Abu Lahab for you. So you'll know that victory is coming. What's the next surah? It's not the destruction of all the enemies of Islam, but the worst enemy of Islam is made an example out of, and he's destroyed, called out, just so we know, just so the, 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 the Prophet knows and the believers know that the promise of Allah that victory is coming is going to happen. Because Abu Lahab was one of the most powerful people in Mecca and also one of the worst enemies of Islam, if not the worst enemy of Islam, arguably the worst enemy of Islam. And Allah took care of him. Now, let's look at this sequence again. The first two surahs were about the dua of Ibrahim. The next two surahs was who's qualified to fulfill the legacy and who's not qualified to fulfill the legacy. The next surah is the one who is qualified declares against war against the one who's not qualified. Once the war is declared, the victor is declared in the next surah. Once the victor is declared, here's a small token that victory is on its way. Abu Lahab, I'll take care of him for you. Which means now their path to victory is clear. There are no obstacles left in our path to victory. When you go for a war for a long time, and we, we know that really well in the United States, when you engage in war for a long time, is it possible you forget where you were fighting in the first place? <laughs> you forget what you're fighting in the first place. What was this struggle for? This is a real problem, by the way. This is a very real problem. There are people who are struggling to establish Islamic work, build a school, do da'wah work, build their organization, They've been at it for years, but you know what? When you're at it for a long time, you sometimes forget why you were starting in the begin to begin with. There are students who, wanted, who, when they first started studying Islam, they said, I just want to get close to Allah. I just want to pray and I want to understand what Allah is saying in every salah. That's all I want. And they've been studying Islam for 10 years now, but they don't pay attention in salat anymore. What happens? You lose sight of why you started. You forget. 
when you started, it was very clear. Over time, the intention and the motivation and the original inspiration that got you started becomes rusty. What does Allah do in this, in, in this sequencing? Allah says, well, I have pa- cleared the path of victory for you. But as the path of victory becomes clear, and you will be able to establish Allah's deen, I need you to remember what this struggle was about to begin with. This struggle was about the legacy of which man? Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, in one word, is Tawheed. It is the oneness of Allah. He is the father of monotheism. One God. The father of all monotheistic faiths, they call him. If that's the case, then we should be reminded of the constitution of this faith after victory. What is the constitution of this faith? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدٌ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ That's what this deen is all about at the end of the day. Just the oneness of God, oneness of Allah. That's all it's about. You know, he has no son, he didn't give birth, and he's not given birth. Now that that's established, Tawheed is established. Here's another important question. Did every prophet preach the same message of one God? Sure. Is it true that every prophet, after a generation or two of him being gone, the th- things started going bad again? And after a few generations, that same nation who was worshipping one God ended up falling into the clutches of shirk again? Did it happen over and over again in history? Sure. Now you have gained victory and you have established the oneness of God. Is it possible that over time you will also fall trapped to the, tra- you know, to the attempts, the attacks of shaitan? Is it possible? Is it possible you will lose your tawheed? Is it possible? Sure. And that oneness of iman, the oneness of God, the tawheed of Allah, the iman in Allah, the la ilaha illallah that lives inside the people's hearts, it has to be protected. But to protect it, you have to protect it from the attacks that come from the outside and the attacks that come from the inside. The attacks that come from the outside should be protected against. So Allah sent us the protection from the outside by revealing قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ These are attacks from the outside that can ruin your faith. What kind of attacks are left? The attacks on the inside. Well, what's last surah? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ We ask Allah to protect us from the whispers of those, of the shayateen, the devils who whisper inside the chests of the people. Beautiful language, Allah says they whisper inside the chests of the people. He does not say they whisper inside the hearts of the people. Beautiful language. What's the difference between saying the devils have access to the chests as opposed to saying the devils have access to the heart? The chest is a place, the heart is a thing. The heart is inside the chest. It is as though they have, imagine there's a castle, but there's a wall outside the castle. So there's a perimeter. The shayateen are given access inside the gate, but they still don't have access to the castle itself. Allah did not give the devils access to our hearts. The only one who can open the door for them is us. That's why he didn't say, الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي قُلُوبِ النَّاسِ He said, الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Everything is connected to everything else and it goes together to make a comprehensive argument. Everything flows together and makes a comprehensive argument. This is the structure of, or the organization of surahs in the Qur'an. There are, for example, there are many examples of this. One surah will talk about, you know, uh, um, it's awesome. One surah will talk about uh, people burning in hellfire. And they're saying, hey, we're burning, but where are those guys that we thought were losers? We don't see them here. Who are they talking about? The Muslims. We don't see them burning. We used to, thought they, we used to think they were pathetic. How come they're not here with us? But the, where are they? In Jannah. The next surah, the conversation is reversed. There are a bunch of people in heaven. There are a bunch of people in paradise. And one of them says, Hey, where's my friend? Where'd he go? We used to hang out together. And guess what he finds out? That friend of his that is missing is where? In Jahannam. So Allah paints one picture in one surah, then He paints the opposite picture in the next surah. 
He does this all over the Qur'an. Things are tied together and connected together. In other words, the organization of the Qur'an and the sequencing of the Qur'an, it does not make itself obvious to you when you're reading it, which is why when you've tried to read the Qur'an before in translation from one to the one chapter, or see I'm saying chapter because you thought it was a chapter, one chapter to the next to the next to the next, you weren't able to see the connection. You're not able to see the connection. It takes work to discover this order. And the more work you put in, the more beautiful it gets. The more remarkable it gets. So on that note, I've tried to talk to you a little bit about the relationship between different parts or different surahs of the Qur'an. But what I want to talk to you about now is actually what happens inside a surah. What about within a surah itself? This is section 9. It's on page 22 of your notes. This is the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. There's lots to talk about here, but I'll make it brief. I feel like I'm running out of time already. I really do. Too many great things to talk to you about. I will have you read this with me out loud. What is A? Good. I need louder next time. What is B? C. Okay, D. E. F. Okay, okay, stop now. Good reading, good job. Okay, read K for me. Do you understand what I'm doing here? It's in the order of the surah? Okay, read K for me again. Okay, read A for me again. Oh. oh read B for me. Read J. Whoa. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go back. Let's go back. Read minister's wife's attempt to seduce you. So that's C. What am I going to make you read now? Read a I. Whoa. What? D. C and D are together. C and D are together, and then I is responding to them. But let's go back again. E. Hmm. Yusuf's imprisonment. H. Uh, okay, okay, okay. This one gotta be off. The King's Dream. Oh my God. You see how the suit is organized? Every problem discussed in the first half of Surah Yusuf is solved in reverse order in the second half of Surah Yusuf. It's a perfect symmetry. When I was in literature class in college, in the first year of college, we were given a homework assignment to compare the story of Joseph in the Bible to the story of Joseph in the Quran. At the time, I was not a student of the Arabic language nor of Islam. As a matter of fact, at the time, I wasn't even interested in religion. And I thought it was a good opportunity to read something from the Qur'an. So in our textbook, they had the two excerpts from the two accounts next to one another, and I read them quickly. And at the time, I thought, I don't know, the Bible just has more details, I guess. Didn't know what to write. And my professor also said, well, the, the Quran's version is pretty much a brief account of the biblical version. Nothing really much to it there. Well, professor, <laughs> I must say, I didn't have to actually learn Arabic to know that there's an incredible literary symmetry in this surah from beginning to the end. I didn't have to know, you know anything else but just the surah itself, just a little bit about it. And to, for, you know, for me to understand that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed this in perfect order. Now imagine to do this as an oral tradition with no edits. First time, he's just reciting it and it just comes out like this. It's just, which is why at the end of it, Allah, you know what Allah says at the end of Surah Yusuf? He says, مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى It's not speech that's made up. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this is literally what Allah says at the end of Surah Yusuf. I've pre previously spoken to you about the symmetry or the order and the structure inside Surah Al-Rahman and its relationship with Surah Al-Waqi'ah. As a brief reminder to you, Surah Al-Rahman has five sections, Surah Al-Waqi'ah has five sections. 
Surah Al-Rahman has five, Surah Al-Waqi'ah has five. Surah Al-Rahman, the first section is the greatness of the Qur'an. First section is about the greatness of the Qur'an. Ar-Rahmanu allama al-Qur'an, khalaqa al-insana allamahu al-bayan. Surah Al-Waqi'ah, the last section is about the greatness of the Qur'an. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمُ اللَّهُ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ so in Surah Al-Rahman, it was section 1, and in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, the next surah, it is section 5. In Surah Al-Rahman, section 2 is about the creations of Allah. In Surah Al-Waqi'ah, section 4 is about the creations of Allah. In Surah Al-Rahman, section 3 is about health, judgment day and hellfire. Section 3 is about judgment day and hellfire. In Surah Al-Waqi'ah, section 3 is about judgment day and hellfire. In Surah Al-Rahman, section 4 is about the first level of Jannah. First two levels of Jannah, or two, two kinds of Jannahs that are at the economy class Jannah, basically. Okay? In Surah Al-Waqi'ah, section, what section should I talk about? Section 2, because we're talking about section 4 from Rahman. So now here, section 2 is about the people of the right hand. Where do people of the right hand go? Enter Jannah. The final section of Surah Al-Rahman is an elite, elaborate, extra beautiful place in Jannah. Section 1 of Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Allah describes the people that are called As-Sabiqoon, As-Sabiqoon, Ula'ika Al-Muqarrabun. The first and the foremost, those are the ones that are brought close to Allah. The first and the foremost, shouldn't they get the elite place in Jannah? <laughs> five sections of Al-Rahman, then reversed in five sections of Al-Waqi'ah, mirroring each other. Just completely mirroring each other. There's remarkable connectivity within a surah of the Qur'an and between surahs of the Qur'an. Within the surah and between the surahs. It's an incredible study. And what it does is it completely changes the way you view the Qur'an as a book. Because for a lot of us, including myself, when I was first introduced to the Qur'an, it, was, it actually didn't feel like a book. It actually felt like a set of isolated ayat. Like you kind of study one ayah at a time, or you learn one lesson at a time, but you don't technically look at it as something connected, and something that's, that flows from one thing to the next to the next. By the way, Qur'an, one of the meanings of qarana is to flow. Some argue that the origin of Qur'an is not qara'a, it's qarana, which actually means to flow. Like the entire Qur'an flows. Make dua that I am able to finish this project with the help of my colleagues. This year's, every year I give myself a new project in Qur'an studies. So this year's project, inshallah, is to write and then eventually present a comprehensive introduction to every surah of the Qur'an. Inshallah ta'ala. The intent is to, when I say comprehensive introduction, not just what are the subjects inside this surah and when it was revealed, but how is the surah organized from beginning to end? How does everything connect with everything else? What is the layout of the surah? Kind of a map of the surah like we did of Surah Yusuf. Kind of like that, uh, uh, the, the exploring the beauty in the map of every surah. You know, and it's going to be quite an adventure, I think, inshallah ta'ala, just to engage in that study. So pray that Allah gives success in that study, bi'ithnillah. Okay, uh, on this note, I do want to highlight at least one, ex since we're on the case of Surah Yusuf, I just want to uh, give one example of uh, things that are talked about in Surah Yusuf. Things are balanced, right? One thing is mentioned here is balanced on the other side. And so there is actually an interesting balance even within the characters that are mentioned in Surah Yusuf. So I'll just highlight one aspect of that. I'll talk about Yusuf salam himself and two opposite sides of his personality. On the one side, there is his humility. And on the other side of humility, there is his confidence. So we'll, we'll contrast those two qualities of Yusuf salam, his humility versus his confidence. You know, kids, they have funny ways of talking. When kids are really excited or nervous, when their kids are nervous, they come to you and they say, uh, you know, like my, my son will come in from the playground, his pants, like his, his over here, there's got dirt on them, his hands are dirty. What happened? What happened, Imad? Um, um, I, I was playing, uh, I was playing, uh, and then I, um, I was playing, and then, um, uh, then we were on the swings, and I, I was playing. <laughs> when kids are nervous, what do they do? They repeat themselves. They, they're not able to finish a sentence. They're not, they don't have enough confidence to be able to finish the whole thought. You have to, it's okay, man, it's okay, you can tell me. You're not in trouble. I'm not going to be mad. It's okay. There's a kind of fear and a kind of nervousness, a kind of humility even, that they're not able to express themselves. You understand? 
Yusuf is a child. He sees a dream. He sees a dream in which 11 stars and the sun and the moon are doing sajda to him. He comes to his dad and he says, Inni ra'aytu. Inni. Ya abati, dad, I love you. Inni ra'aytu. No doubt about it. I did see it. Really, I did. I did. The fact that he said inni, he almost expects that it's so crazy, dad won't believe me. <coughs> so he said, Inni ra'aytu. He said, Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban wa shams wal qamar. No doubt, dad, I'm telling you, really, I did see it, dad. I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon. And he stopped. He, doesn't, he stops talking. He doesn't stop. He doesn't continue. It's almost as though he has to be, it's okay, you can tell me. You can tell me. And he had to start over again and said, because you know, when he got to 11 stars and the sun and the moon, what were the sun and the moon doing? What were they doing? They were prostrating. That part is the part that bothered him. Because he's so humble and for him to be, because you know, prostrating to someone is to consider them great. It's a way of, it's kind of like praising myself. Things were doing sajda to me, by the way, dad. Right here. <laughs> this is where I sat. Even the sun and the moon. And the 11, star, 11 stars. You know? But he's so humble that the idea of them doing such that to him bothers him so much. He said, I saw 11 stars. He says, I saw the sun. He says, I saw the moon. But when it came to the part about sajda, he couldn't continue. So he had to start over again. And he says, Ra'aytuhum li sajideen. I saw them. Wait, he already said, I saw in the beginning. He already said that in the beginning. He had to say it again. Ra'aytuhum li sajideen. And it's interesting that in the language of the ayah, he uses the living pronouns, which suggests that he already had interpreted the dream. He doesn't say, Ra'aytuha or Ra'aytuhunna. He said, Ra'aytuhum li sajidina, which means he used al aqil, right? Which linguistically, what that means is he actually, by the way he spoke, you could tell he already figured it out that it was his 11 brothers and his mom and his dad, which is what bothered him even more. And his dad's really smart. He picked up on the fact that this kid is really sharp. He figured out a dream and he's this young and he can already figure it out. And he's telling me and the way he told me the dream, I could tell he already figured it out too. Which is why his dad was really impressed with him and complimented him with a bunch of compliments in the next ayah. But this, I wanted to highlight this portion at least for a couple of reasons. The first reason is it illustrates the humility of Yusuf It also illustrates how many dads in the audience? Fathers? Any fathers? Okay. This is for you and me. I'm a father too. This is for you and me. Your sons and your daughters, are they so comfortable with you? Are they so at ease with you as a father that they see a dream and the first person they want to tell is you? <laughs> Dad, I saw a dream. Go tell your mother, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, most of the time our kids are talking to us, we're not even listening. Especially if it's our girls talking, because they talk a lot. <laughs> Dad, you know what happened at school today? I was, writing a book, I, was, I was reading a book, and then my friend came and said, why are you reading this book? I said, because it's in my homework. I wanted to do homework in the library instead of going home and doing the homework. <laughs> but then we started talking, we started playing tic-tac-toe. She won the first one, I won the second one, I won the third one, she won the fourth one. It was really bad. What are you doing in the meantime? Mm-hmm. That's great. Wow. That's wonderful. You're not listening. <laughs> and the girl knows you're not listening. So she says, Dad, can I have five dollars? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Can I tell Mama you said give him five dollars? Mm-hmm. Yes. So she goes over to the mother. Abba said, you need to give me five dollars. <laughs> then the mother calls you. Did you say give her? Mm-hmm. Because you're not listening to the wife either. <laughs> and that's how your girl makes money. <laughs> the ayah is teaching parents that they have to live up to the legacy of Yaqub and be attentive listeners to their children. As a matter of fact, Yusuf was not raised by a father. He was raised just in his early childhood by that father. Pretty much the rest of his young years were raised as a servant living in another house without a father figure. He had no father figure. And you know a lot of times in modern society, they say that young people resort to crime because they have no father figure. Single family homes, mothers raising the son, the son goes out, has no father figure, so he gets involved in crimes, gangs, drugs, alcohol, partying, 
you name it. And then they say, well, because he had no dad in the home. There's no dad in the home and that's why. And there's actually a judge in Brooklyn, in New York, who wrote a book on this because he was a juvenile judge. He was a judge for 35 years and he, he sent like 18, 19 year olds to jail. And his conclusion at the end of 35 years is when there is no father figure, you will get young people turning to crime. That was his conclusion. And I can almost guarantee you that is not just a conclusion for Brooklyn, New York. I can almost guarantee you that's a conclusion for the entire world. But the problem here is, Yusuf salam only received fatherly counsel at a very, very young age, and then the father was no more. He wasn't available. What we're learning then is, even fatherly counsel at a very young age can be so powerful that it can help you survive teen years. Because a young man without a father and a mother in a house and a lady is saying, come on, don't you want to have some fun? And he backs away. He backs away. The only tarbiyah he had was from his dad. That's all. And the fact that he's thrown in prison. And when he talks to prisoners, he says, by the way, I follow the religion of my dad. He, he talked about his dad in prison. Where did he learn about his dad? When he was little. What we're learning in the ayah is the value and the power of early education. Especially when it comes from which figure? The father. Anyway, this was a little bit about the humility of Yusuf a.s. In Islam, we celebrate humility. We are supposed to be humble, brother. Don't praise anyone. Don't let anybody become arrogant. This is why husbands never praise their wives, right? right? We're trying to make them humble. We're, we're doing them a favor. We're helping them out. They help us out too. They help us a lot, don't they? Like some of you have blood pressure problems. Your wife, or you have low blood pressure, so your wife helps you by keeping your blood pressure high. <laughs> This is an act of love, you have to understand. It's an act of love. Like your wife will come to you, what kind of sandwich you want? Chicken or turkey? And you'll say chicken. She says, we don't have any chicken. <laughs> and it'll raise your blood pressure. She's keeping you healthy. This is why she's doing this. But anyway. <laughs> now let's talk a little. So on the one hand, there is humility. What's on the opposite end of humility? Arrogance. Does Islam endorse arrogance? Does Islam encourage arrogance? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, one of the worst things you can have inside of you is arrogance. Even if you have a little bit of it, you can't get into Jannah. But the problem is when so many Muslims in the world confuse arrogance with confidence. Islam is against arrogance, but Islam is not against confidence. So what's the difference between arrogance and the confidence, you ask? Surah Yusuf can teach us. Yusuf alayhi salam, before we talk about Yusuf alayhi salam, let's, let's actually give you an example. We used to, you know, in the United States, we have some states where there's a big Muslim population. New York has a big Muslim population. Houston has a big Muslim population. California, the state of California has a large Muslim population. But there are some states in the United States where there's very small Muslim populations. There are some universities where there's like four Muslim students. Some universities have 4,000 Muslim students, but some have maybe four or three Muslim students. So you go to one of these towns, and there's like three Muslim students, and two of them don't even know how to pray. They pray in English. And one of them is a hafiz of Qur'an. One of them is at least a hafiz of He's not an alim. He's not an alim, but he's memorized the whole Qur'an. But he's very humble. There's no masjid in the entire town. So when Jum'ah comes, they get it together in one of the rooms in college. We should have Jum'ah prayer. And between the three of them, who should be leading the prayer? The Hafid of Qur'an. But the Hafid of Qur'an is a very humble guy. They ask him, bro, can you, can you lead the prayer? No, ya akhi al-kareem. I am nothing. I am no one. I do so much sin. I am not worthy to stand on the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't know how many sins I commit. I am a filthy human being. And the other guy says, well, I think you're a filthy human being too. <laughs> but the other guy will re lead the prayer in English. Can you please lead the prayer, dude? The problem with this young Hafil who's super humble is that he's confusing what with what? 
Arrogance with confidence. There are situations where Allah expects you to rise to the occasion and step up and be a man and be a woman. Because nobody else is going to do it. Just do it. Look, the fact that I am coming here in Malaysia to speak to you about the Qur'an is embarrassing to me. This is a Muslim country. I shouldn't be coming here to teach. I should be coming here to learn. There are people in the audience that know a hundred times more than I do, I guarantee it. About the Book of Allah, I guarantee it, I have no doubt about it. There are people even, even in the United States that have so much more knowledge than I do of the Book of Allah that to, compared to me, compared to them, I am not even a kindergartner. I'm not. So somebody says to me, when there are so many more knowledgeable people than you, why do you open your mouth? Why do you speak? I say because I have confidence in the fact, not that I know more, but I have confidence in the fact that people are benefiting from me teaching. Teaching. And I'm hoping that other teachers, other scholars, listen to some of me teaching and say to themselves, what does this clown know about the Qur'an? Let me teach it. And then they teach it way better than I teach it, and I'll say, okay, this is good. Now I don't, I'm not needed anymore. I want to make myself irrelevant. I do. My hopes with my own students are, they go f way further than I go, because the bar has to be raised. But I am confident in what I'm doing now, because, and I'll tell you why, because of Surah Yusuf. Yusuf alayhi salam is very humble in his childhood. You remember this? He comes out of jail. He interprets a dream. He interprets the king's dream. You remember this? He interprets the king's dream. Now they, 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 he brings him to court. His innocence is proven. And they find out that there's going to be a major economic crisis for seven years. There's not going to be any food available. We have to ration the supplies. If you don't manage this economic crisis carefully, people will starve to death. The entire society could crumble. The empire could be destroyed. This is a very serious matter for the entire nation. The right man is needed for the job. Yusuf salam looks around the court of the king and says, well, these ministers, yeah, they're all idiots. Why don't you hire me? Make me responsible over the treasury, tre treasury of the entire country. Make me the national treasurer. Make me the treasury secretary. He nominated who? Himself. The king didn't say, hey, could you please do this job? And he said, no, please, I am just a prisoner. I, I. No, no, no. And by the way, what are his qualifications? Has he gone to an elite university to understand economics and finance? Has he done that? No. Where, was, where did he spend a lot of his youth? As a servant. Where did he spend the rest of his youth? As a prisoner. And now he's standing in front of a king and saying, I need to be the treasury secretary. Do you understand the confidence of this man when he's speaking? Why? Because he says, there are two qualifications you people need for this job, and it's not a PhD in economics. What you people need is someone who will take their job seriously, hafil. And secondly, you'll need someone who will be honest. And honestly, you don't, you have politicians in the room. <laughs> I'm the right guy for the job. He nominated himself. When nobody else is there to take up the task, and you know that Allah has given you a gift that you can use to help other people, then you don't say, no, no, I'm nothing, I'm no one, I'm a mosquito, I'm a cockroach, no, no, no. <laughs> you do it. You step up to the plate and you do it. Let me then tell you what arrogance is. May Allah protect all of us from arrogance, starting with myself. What is arrogance? Arrogance is two things. One, when you are impressed with yourself. And two, when you think of yourself as better than others. Those are the two problems of arrogance. None of us should be impressed with ourselves. But that doesn't mean we deny the gifts Allah gave us. I have no shame in saying I think Allah made me a good teacher. I have no shame in saying it. But I also have no shame in saying that I have lots of lots of flaws. If you want to know a list of them, email my wife, she'll tell you. She's, got a long, she's pretty much written a book on it and she's got a long list. Okay. My, my father can tell you my flaws. My mother can tell you my flaws. And if you want to protect yourself from arrogance, let me give you some personal advice. This is not from the Quran and Sunnah. It's personal advice. 
How do you protect yourself from arrogance? You have to be around people who are not impressed with you. Which means your mother. <laughs> if, you are, if you spend time with your mother, you will stay humble. If you, for young men, you really want to be humble, spend time with your dad. Because you will be a loser as long as you live <laughs> with your dad. You're a loser. You could finish your PhD and he said, when I was your age, I had four PhDs. <laughs> he will never be satisfied with you. You are never good enough. So you want a humility check? Just give your dad a call and talk to him for 15 minutes. It will bring you back to earth. Okay? <laughs> so, but the balance, the incredible balance between humility on the one end, because you know, in the people doing sajda to him, it is as though he is better than other people. That, if he accepted that, that would be arrogance. He had a problem with that. But when it came to helping other people and stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility, then you gotta do what you gotta do. You know? People come to me all the time. I had a student this year, it was really interesting. I had a student this year, uh, a young lady from, from England. Ustad, what am I gonna do when I go back? I want to stay here in Texas because there's nobody there to learn from. There's nothing to do there. <laughs> I know it's terrible. <laughs> but uh, you know what I told her? I told her, uh, there's nothing to do there because you're not there. There's no activities for women there. I said, they're not there because you're here. <laughs> Go there. <laughs> you need to do something yourself. We keep waiting for someone to come and help us. You know, this is actually, this is a true story. I used to be like that. I used to complain. Why do you think we don't have good leaders? Why do you think we don't have any good activities at the masjid? Why do you think there aren't enough youth programs? Why do you think there isn't this? Why do you think there isn't that? And one of my mentors, I still remember, one of my older brothers, you know, in, in deen, in, in learning, he grabbed my arm one time and goes, no more. And he's Pakistani, he said a good Pakistani accent. He goes, Naman, if you cannot find the man, you had to be the man. <laughs> so like, okay, I'll be the man. <laughs> but that's what I tell you guys too. We have to step up. We have to stop hiding behind excuses. You know, it's time we do that. I did want to give you one more example of the structure of surahs. We did talk about Surah Yusuf. Maybe one more example and I'll give you your next break, inshallah. And perhaps the example I will give you, uh, which one should I pick? Okay, let's take Surah Al-Hijr. It's actually a really interesting example. Uh, here, the structure of a surah can be studied from many angles, but one angle I'd like to talk to you about is the beginning and the end of a surah. Meaning the, the way a surah begins, it is somehow correlated with the way a surah ends. Those two things go hand in hand with each other, okay? So, in Surah Al-Hijr, Allah says, Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitabi wa Quran Mubin. Let me translate that for you. Alif Lam Ra, those are the miraculous signs, the ayat of the book and a clear and clarifying Quran. This gives me an opportunity to talk to you about a very important concept in Arabic and in the Quran. The Quran is clear. The Quran is clear. But the Quran is not simple. The Qur'an is clear, but the Qur'an is not simple. Some people come up to me and ask me sometimes, Allah says that the Qur'an is easy, the Qur'an is simple. Then why do you give such elaborate linguistic explanations? You're supposed to keep it simple. If it's so simple, why is it so hard to understand? And they use the word simple. And I have a problem with the usage of that word because Allah never used that word in the Qur'an. Allah did use the word clear though, mubin. Clear and clarifying. Now what is the difference between clear and simple? When I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, that is clear and it is simple. Now if a PhD in calculus solves a major mathematical problem on the board that takes four pages, it takes up the entire board and he solves a calculus problem, for a student of calculus who is good, his solution is clear. But his solution is still not simple. Clarity has nothing to do with simplicity. These are two different things. Clarity 
is about whether or not your answer makes sense to someone who thinks about it. So for a medical student, his, his advanced med medical terms are very clear to him, even though the terms themselves are not simple. You understand? Those are two distinct things. The Qur'an is clear, but it is not simple. Why? Because the Qur'an solves very complex problems. Humanity has complex problems. And Allah gave sometimes complex solutions to those complex problems. The idea in the Qur'an is not that those solutions are simple, but the idea certainly is that those solutions are clear. Here's another issue here. Let's add one more, more bit to this problem. But Allah does say that Allah made the Qur'an easy. وَلَقَدْ يَصَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ Didn't he? He said he made the Qur'an easy. So how come it's not easy? Well, he, did, he didn't just say he made it easy. He said he made it easy for remembrance. If you want to remember Allah, if you want to do dhikr of Allah, if you want to gain some advice, if you want to memorize, then the Qur'an is easy. But if you want to dive into the depths, that's not when he said it's easy. He put the ease of the Qur'an associated with the remembrance of Allah. So it's easy for you to memorize the Fatiha. It's easy for you to remember the lessons of Wal-Asri in the Linsana Lafi Khusr. It's easy for you when you want to remember and get some advice from the Qur'an. He facilitated it for that reason. That's what Aqad Yassan al Quran al Dhikr. Anyway, the beginning of the surah says that the ayat, these are ayat of a clear book and a, a clear Quran. Okay, what does the, the end say? Well, here's something that can destroy the Quran's clarity. The people who took the Quran and tore it to pieces. In other words, an attack against the clarity of the Quran is that you look at some ayahs from over here, but you don't look at the rest of the ayahs. If you take a piece of the Qur'an and not the other pieces of the Qur'an and come to a conclusion, then that will remove its clarity. So the subject matter of the Qur'an's clarity is actually completely covered from beginning to the end. Then Allah says in the beginning of the surah, very interestingly, رُبَّمَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ كَانُوا مُسْلِمِينَ رُبَّمَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ كَانُوا مُسْلِمِينَ Perhaps the disbelievers will wish that they were Muslims. When will they wish that they were Muslims? Disbelievers are going to wish that they were Muslims? When will that happen? Judgment day, which is why at the end, فَوَرَبِّكَ لَنَسْأَلَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ I swear to your master, we will interrogate all of them. And by the way, when the interrogation begins on judgment day, what will they wish? That they were Muslims. Then he says in the beginning, ذَرْهُمْ Leave them alone. يَأْكُلُوا وَيَتَمَتَّعُوا وَيُلْهِهِمُ الْأَمَلُوا فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ Let them eat and enjoy. Let them, let them do whatever they want. And let their false hopes confuse them and delude them and mislead them, they'll soon find out. What will they find out? Amma kanu ya'malun. They'll find out the things they used to do. We will interrogate them about the things they used to do. Now what are the things they used to do? The ayah tells us in the beginning, they used to eat and enjoy and be deluded. That's what they used to do. My favorite correlation though is at the end, the Prophet ﷺ used to be made fun of. They used to insult the Prophet ﷺ. They used to say, قَالُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِي نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرِ إِنَّكَ لَمَجْنُونَ Hey you, the one who the reminder comes to, you're crazy. That's how I'm translating the ayah. Hey you, the one who the reminder comes to, the dhikr comes to you, right? Let me tell you, you're insane. You're possessed by a jinn. And at the end of the surah, what does Allah say? Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, Now in the beginning, the kuffar were talking to him. At the end, inna kafayna kal mustahzi'in, walaqad na'lamu annaka yudiku sadra yadiku sadruka bima yakunun. We are enough against you. We are enough for you against all of those who make fun of you. I'll take care of them for you. Who are, who are the ones who made fun of him? When are they mentioned? In the beginning. And at the end, Allah says, I'll take care of them. And then Allah also says, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ We already know that your chest hurts, your heart hurts. You get bad feelings in your heart because of what they say. That's mentioned at the end. Now Allah doesn't say what they say at the end because He already said that where? In the beginning. And what is it that they say? That He's insane. So surahs, even long surahs, you'll find a beautiful correlation between the beginning and the end. Subject matters are tied like that. And by the way, that's good practice for a teacher. Because teachers, if they know what they're doing, when they start a class, they introduce the lesson. And when they end a the class, they go over what they covered in the beginning. Before they tie up the lesson. They kind of do a quick review and they move on, right? So that's supposed to be a teaching methodology anyway. And it's captured and encapsulated inside the Qur'an.